The Pacers season is officially here. No more offseason, no more roster stuff. It's time for the games, and Rhett Bauer is going to join us to break it down. Bold predictions, record choices, in-season tournament. Can they win the division, regression, and progression candidates, and so much more on today's Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Wednesday. Congrats. You made it through the offseason and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI. And today we're previewing all things Pacers 2024-25. Rhett Bauer is going to join us for a very fun episode, our second straight year doing the season preview together with so many things to talk about. Can they win the Central Division and the in-season tournament? Once again, progression candidates or growth candidates, regression candidates, potential X factors, guys to watch out for in general for various reasons, plus, of course, our official record predictions for the coming season. And in between, so much more. We basically touch on everybody at various points as we do. It's going to be a fun season for the Pacers. It begins tonight in Detroit. And let's break it all down. What could happen and what could not with Rep Hour. Games are happening. The NBA is back. And the Pacers are back tonight in Detroit to take on the Pistons to kick off their highest expectations campaign in a decade, in five years, whatever you want to say. They haven't been thought of with this much chance to win things, to win series in a while. It's going to be very fun. We'll be t- talking about it every step of the way here on Lockdown Pacers. And today, to preview lots of things, win totals, the end season tournament, bold predictions, and many other things. You've heard him here many times. I don't think since about free agency, though, I gave him time off to do lots of stuff, including move. It's Rhett Bauer with the new background without the jerseys. Rhett, welcome back. Uh, this season is going to be wild, I think. Yes, yeah, hopefully wild in like good ways where we can see a bunch of good stuff happen and not like wild like, you know, COVID happening or something oh, crazy going on in the world, but yeah, let's uh let's have some wild basketball this year. Golly. It is there's already two games that have happened before I say this, but I uh I think last year I said this too, but I think a very crazy NBA trying to how many teams are trying right now. And I think that's going to be very fascinating throughout the season. And I think a big theme of the year will be what teams are willing to push buttons and change directions faster because not all, not 26 teams can uh, have a nice season, even though like last year, nobody was really tanking. And this year, it feels like it's about the same number, but the difference is this is a much stronger draft. So how quickly these ships can change will be fascinating. This is Pacers only, and we have much to get to to discuss this season. And we start with the biggest question, Rhett. Just kidding. I'm not going to do the win total question yet. I want to ask something that I thought was very interesting can they win the central division something they have not done for a long time last year pacers one game behind the Cavs, two wins behind the bucks they were within striking distance can they do it can they do it i believe the first time in over a decade yeah i think you'd probably be going back to 2013 14 correct well, i can't remember if it was 13 14 or 12, 13, but yeah, so uh, I think that Chris Middleton not starting the year healthy leans me to believe that it's possible. I don't know what the Cavs will look like. I know Kenny Atkinson, one of the biggest tropes of this offseason um, from just like expectation perspective is cutting minutes for starters. And usually when you do that, your team is worse. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's crazy. Maybe not in the Pacers case, um, but uh, yeah, so I it's definitely possible if Dame bounces back and gets more comfortable, then maybe Chris Middleton missing isn't that big of a deal. But uh, I I don't know. I feel like the Pacers have just as many, like, I don't know about questions, but not like concrete, confident um, projections as, as any of the teams do. But they, they I think they have their best chance since that all the way back then since the bucks have been dominant for the last like five or six years in the conference or the division. So last year, the, the bucks smoked the Pacers that one game where Giannis had 60 billion points. I only bring that game up because if the Pacers had won that specific game, they would have won the division last year <laughs> because they would have had the tiebreaker over the bucks and Cavs and the same number of wins. So they were like that close and they've won it four times since the century turned. You were correct. Last time was 20, 20- 13 14. There are two conference finals runs in a row, but right before that was the D Rose Bulls. And since then it was LeBron's Cavs and Giannis's Bucks, and that's it. And they've had a a 
outside, I guess outside of the D Rose Bulls, who were really good, but not ever like a championship contender, between the Pistons of the early 2000s and Giannis and LeBron, twice LeBron have had a stacked division, like like my whole life basically, right? So having a chance to win it is a big deal. And last year, no one's really talking about this, but I think they can. I think that's a cool subplot, and I wish it mattered more. It's not guaranteed home court anymore like it used to be. Uh, I wish that was in-season tournament groups. It was just your division. Make those games matter even more. But I think that is something fun to track this year. Can the Pacers win the division? And I say yes, they can, for the reason I just said. They were one game away last year, and you're all over it. If Chris Middleton's out for any amount of time, that makes the Bucks worse. And, yeah, they're the creakiest team with expectations this year by far. They have Giannis. They could be awesome. They added better minimum players than they had last year, but they won 49 games last year and have an old team that got older. Right? There's very much a chance they're worse. And you just never know with coaching changes. I think the Cavs with Kenny, Kenny Atkinson should be better than the Cavs with J.B. Bickerstaff. I think that they have young players who should get better. I also thought that the Pacers could get better when they switch from one night to the next, and they did not get better switching from one night to the next. Like you just, you just don't know with coaching changes and literally no roster moves. And Max Struess is hurt for a while, so yeah, those are their main competitors already dealing with stuff and questions. I think it's very possible the Pacers win the division. I think they have to start strong. Their first 13 games are, are hard, and then it gets a lot easier. I, I, I maintain this. It's going to sound bad, but even if they're 6-7, six and 7-6 seven, seven and six just through 13, that won't feel good. No one will be like, yeah, they're playing great. If they get to that, they're going to have a really good record by Thanksgiving and Christmas because of how much their schedule eases up in their favor, assuming they're as good as it seems like they should be. And question two about can the Pacers win blank? Can they do that in-season tournament thing again? Can they win... Maybe not the East, because that requires beating Boston again, although they did it last year. Can they win their group, do you think? Can they be back in Vegas this year? I mean, I I don't know why they couldn't. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> who the heck knows how, how serious to take the in-season tournament games. Um, but, you know, I, I'm excited Very. to see. Well, I mean, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, what does it mean? You know, half of, a, half of the in-season tournament championship made it to the conference finals, and the other half we don't need to talk about what they did or didn't do. Um, I just think that's going to be, it's going to be fascinating to see like what that, whether that environment can sustain, even in during like the regular season games, whether those end up meaning something. I don't see why not. I mean, it's just, uh, there's really no reason to expect why they couldn't do it again, considering we had no clue that they would do it last year and they did. So I think they have, the second easiest group in the East, but yet maybe the easiest one to win because the Celtics is not in theirs. Mm -hmm. And so their group, for those who don't remember, is Bucks, Heat, Raptors, Pistons. So I, on one hand, as I said on yesterday's podcast, think the Pistons are a little better than they're being given credit for. On the other hand, I just said they could be better than the Bucks this year. Like it's very possible they're the best team in that group, right? So yeah, the group A is much, maybe much harder at the top, but much worse at the bottom. Group C has the Celtics, like Group B maybe you'd say is the easiest to win, even though it's not the easiest group of total teams, if that makes any sense. Mm. I'm not counting them out. <laughs> I saw it last year. Uh, but it, it, the nature of a best of one bracket means I don't necessarily, like it was Lakers Pacers last year, who both were six seeds or worse in their conference by the end of the year. I don't necessarily think you'd be like, oh, obviously the best team's going to win the in-season tournament. Uh, but they can do it. They They're... Top end potential suggests it's possible, and their group suggests it's possible. Bring on the fun. Lower two banners. Eastern Conference in-season tournament winners again, and Central Division. Lower them on the same day. Man, I mean, between, like, if the Raptors end up pivoting being, like, bad, bad, then that could, and then the Bucks don't get healthy, and the Heat continue just, being the heat where they are just not going to go away, but they're also not going to rise above the expectations of just, they're not going to go away. Then yeah, you, they could absolutely have the easiest, but looking at Boston's group where they have the Cavs, the bulls, the Hawks and the wizards like that could, <laughs> that could get <laughs> ugly really quick for a I team. I have the a Celtics. feeling these Celtics will be in the quarterfinals <laughs> of the end season tournament. Again. <laughs> There's not a lot of like even missing Porzingis and yeah. knowing that they're gonna rest Horford and probably Drew and and White at some point. It's like it is just a laughable group of teams, but that's also kind of the East. And last year, like like the coming out party for the Pacers was the Sixers and Bucks wins in the in season tournament, yep. right? Like because their their group last year was not like impossible. They had Cavs, Sixers, and Bucks, right? Like it was mm -hmm. tough. 
Now they get bucks again. The plot required that. Thank you, yep. NBA, for giving us that. But they had a tough group last year and they handled it. So it is a little easier this time. They are in the second pod of teams. I hate that I'm talking about this. Uh, they can win it. I'm rooting for the fun stuff. That's the non-game stuff. Let's move to the biggest question people have, the biggest season preview thing that people like to do, the win totals. I have mine on the record, and I'll state it again in a second. But to you, one, Rhett, do you think they go over, under, and why? And then we'll talk about the other side of the token after you're done. Everybody, short little break here. We got to talk about the lovely folks over at FanDuel. NFL fans, the season is rolling, and you can keep things going and get in on the action with a big return over on FanDuel. They are America's number one sportsbook. So when it happens to you, it happens to everybody. You get that hunch in the middle of a game. You can see what's coming in your brain. Well, you can check out the latest stats so you can see who's doing well and what's going on. You can view live play-by-play so you can see the timing of the game and where the flow is headed. And you can see so much more all on the same page where you place your bets. You know the right timing and the right moments to place those bets for those hunches. Plus, on FanDuel, you will get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That is on FanDuel.com. I the think number right now, by the way, is 47 and a half wins for the Indiana Pacers this year. I think that the Pacers' depth will lead them to the um, lead me to be more comfortable in the over than the under. But I like 47, 48 is darn near right on the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the lines opened lower than this, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I it was such an easy over I think because the win total was less than what they had last year uh, when the, when the, the first win totals came out. But I think between, you know, expecting Halliburton to be, even if he does miss games, at least he's not coming back to play 20 minutes a game for like a month or whatever. No financial incentive for that anymore. Right. Exactly. So I think that that, you know, even if he is missing, like there's something to be said for, the expectations of missing your key player rather than your key player playing for 20 minutes a game. Like I could sometimes just be weird. And then, you know, just the internal growth and of entire year of Siakam um, plus just the continuity and hoping that we get some young players to play well and have a lot of next men up with guys like Jarris and Shepard and, and uh, maybe even Furphy coming into the fold. Like there's a lot of bodies to throw at an 82 game regular season. So I, I think it's a pretty, if you're going to make me pick, I'm I'm going to pick the over just because I don't see how they, like, unless there's something, again, something crazy goes on. I don't see them being worse than last year, even though the top of the East got a, a good amount better. Yeah. Last year's was super easy. Last year's over under was 37 and a half and they yeah. won 30, 35 right that year. And yep. they added Bruce Brown and it was like, okay, is there uh, that he's obviously worth more than two wins, especially if all these guys get better. Like <laughs> that was a joke this year. It's much harder for the reasons you said the East is better at the top. So it's kind of conflicting viewpoints of they won 47 last year, but it's harder to get 47, right? Like the mm-hmm. extra wins the Pacers would get now would come against. Well, typically you say this to get from 47 to 55, you have to beat other teams that are that good. Now the Pacers yes. lost a bunch of crap games last year. So I guess they specifically maybe get rid of that thinking, but normally that's the thinking. And so the way they'd get worse is we'll get to that in a second for the under actually, but the, the route for better is pretty obvious. And you just know a lot of it. 41 more games of Siakam, even if he's a little worse, 41 more games is a lot more games, right? <laughs> like that's worth more value. And then they have, so many guys you'd consider pre-prime or ascending or whatever you want to say. I've always used we're on their rookie deal, but you can use whatever phrasing you want between Halberton's just now off of it. Nemhard's still technically in his first deal. Mathern's in his first deal. Walker's in his first deal. Toppin just got out. Neesmith just got out. Isaiah Jackson's still in it. That's all rotation players. So the odds that none of them are better at all is super low, even though it's like young guys get better at different rates all the time. We saw what happened with Chris Duarte here. Right, Tyrese Halbert talked about that being hard for him early in his second season. Like, it's not guaranteed that all of them are better. It's not guaranteed that any of them are better. But the odds that none of them are is pretty low. And oh, and Ben Shepard could be considered in this mix too. So literally any one of them being better, plus 41 more games of Siakam, 
already makes me think, yes, they should be better than last year. Does that offset how much better the East got is the question. When I ran through their schedule, which only 80 are scheduled, it's important to point out, I got 47. They're over under 47 and a half. So they'd have to win one of the two extra scheduled in-season tournament games for me to go over. And I think they're an over 500 team. So I'd say yes, I will say over. I think it's close. But I think there's more ways they go. This is what I said last year, too, even though last year the gap was much bigger. There's more ways to me they go over than ways they go under. And I'm ignoring the whole, like, everybody gets hurt thing. Like, duh, they'll suck if everybody gets hurt. But that is, to me, why I picked the overs, because there's more routes to that, even though there are underpass, which we'll get to in a second. Well, I think, too, I think, you know, obviously last year having Jalen Smith and Isaiah Jackson to back up Miles and, you know, do more of like a backup center by committee throwing in some Siakam or Ovi Toppin at the five as well. Like I think purely having Ajax back there, if what we saw in the playoffs from Ajax can translate will be worthwhile. And if it doesn't translate, then you get more of Siakam and Obi at the five, which also could just be worthwhile. Um, But you know, Matherin only playing 59 games last year, that's going to be worth something. If Mm -hmm. Jarris plays more than he did last year, it's going to be because he does well. And if he doesn't get in the rotation, it's because the rotation is doing so well that he doesn't get in the rotation. (laughs) So like, you know, all of that, like you said, I think you're exactly right. The more uh, there's more paths to going right than going wrong. But what is the biggest path to going wrong for you for the under? Okay. One would be, uh, McConnell and yep. and Siakam, the two over thirty year olds, that mm-hmm. like they them taking even some steps back, which is possible over thirty. They're the I I don't know where you consider Turner on the age curve, but uh, to me, let's just say for the sake of argument, McConnell and Siakam are, are two post prime players. Okay, the thing that makes that important is they both have the ball a lot, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And that matters a great deal. So if both of them are are not as effective as last year for whatever reason. Right. McConnell could just have the ball less because Matherin's back in the fold. And maybe that ends up being a fine thing, but like that could be a way that he's less effective. Or Siakam's just not as good as last year for whatever reason. He's only 30. That, that shouldn't happen, but it could. Right. That would be one way. Aging does come. And if they can't offset that with various other things, that's possible to me. You know, you never know what you're going to get from guys of that age. I, I let me let me Lightly throw this in, even though I just shook this point off. They were healthy last year. Like, not like catastrophic injuries. Duh, they'd go under if that happens. But like, with even like normal injuries, that that would be a worse injury situation than last year. And the third one is this thing I'm going to keep saying, even though I don't believe it's going to happen or is possible. I'm going to keep bringing up the Kings, okay? Two years ago's Kings were so fast. And whoa, look at this blur of De'Aaron Fox. And they're awesome. And they're the third seed. They won 48 games. This is great. This is awesome. Here they come. They're going to be better next year, right? They kept their whole team. They have this awesome identity. Uh, they, and then they were the plan. And they didn't even make the postseason. And their offense went from second or first to 13th or 14th. And they got better on defense to offset that. So it's not that, like, you're guaranteed to go with a similar roster from awesome on offense to being awesome on offense again. That said, that said, I'm saying that's possible. And that's a reason they could go under. That said, I predicted with Will Fern, our over-unders, that the Pacers would have better than the 3.5 offensive rating in the league. I still think they'll have a top three offense. They had the best offense in the league in the preseason and didn't even look that good in the preseason. So I highly doubt, highly doubt, they'll be bad on offense. But I have seen this exact thing happen very recently. So it's not a lock that their identity translates, but any of those things that I just mentioned are plausible to me. If they go under, that wouldn't be like, wow, this was so impossible to predict kind of things. Yeah, I do. I it would be c- curious to see what comparing that Kings team to this last year's Pacers team, as far as like statistical anomalies and career years and stuff like that might look like to like, what indicators were there that the Kings shouldn't have been taken as seriously or like ha- should not have had the expectation. But I think too is it's kind of the same expectation as what the Pacers have right now. It's like, were the Kings expected to improve on their third seed? No, <laughs> no, they were not. Were the Pacers right. supposed to repeat as Eastern Conference? And that Kings no. team was like, we talked about the Pacers being pretty healthy last year. That Kings team was like stunning. Yes. Like, all, like their top eight played like 72 or more, something insane, yes. which was, which was cool. But the beam was cool, but yes, that was not, yes. that was not, that should not have been expected to repeat. No, and and that was one thing that I was going to say is a downside is, you know, you only get to catch the league by surprise once. Yeah, like, that's and that 
that could have been last year for the Pacers. Now, I think that we saw in the playoffs, you know, the way that the team plays can take you by surprise, even within a seven game series that you're, you think you know how to play. And then it just keeps happening. And I think the Pacers were surprising themselves by some of the defense that they were playing in some of those cases. And so if that can trend up, then, you know, it's a very easy um, path to the over, but on the, you know, on the under side of things, like if, if the league is going to be more physical too, and the Pacers who are a very foul happy team and also are not like the most foul drawing team, like they do not draw a lot of fouls that could slow their offense down and make their defense worse. And so that is one small between not taking the league by surprise, like teams are going to get up to play the Pacers, especially with seems like Ty sometimes has a, has like he talks, <laughs> he talks a little bit. So it seems like once you get that, it's the Trey Young thing, right? It's like once you start to actually get the respect, now you're going to be considered overrated, especially yeah. as like a you don't play defense as a point guard, the blah, blah blah. But I don't think it's going to happen. But again, you know, you can't you can't surprise somebody twice. And uh, if if the defense ends up being more physical, then that that does not exactly play into the Pacers' favor, unless the Pacers' physicality can, you know, if Neesmith can hang on to like two and a half fouls a game then <laughs> who knows what the paces will be like so you just said something that i didn't really have room to put in this podcast but now i want to say I, uh, I hear a lot of pacer season preview stuff that i listen to and i'm like yeah these are fine points i think a lot of the like general consensus pacers being low people being lower on the pacers than i am or than most people are is that i just i just think tyrese halbert's better than other people do <laughs> like, yes yeah really, it's really easy <laughs> yes he's amazing like I, I I I see these player rankings and he's always like 12th to 16th. And I'm like, that's, I get it. But like, <laughs> that's like not, it, it, that's like the low end of his range to me. Like he's really, really good. Well, and I, I think too, realize how good he is. Uh, it's like conflating like, you know, Kawhi versus, you know, regular season yeah, Kawhi versus they're all Kawhi. They're at that point, right? Like, yeah. What am I doing, right? That's but, great. But like for 82 games, you, it's tough to, I don't know. Yeah, I'm right there with you. So much of like the oh, can they can they do it again? Like they had this match. I'm like, yes. (laughs) Did you see how good that guy was? Like, (laughs) matter of fact, should probably be better. Like, yeah, yeah, and he's 24, right? Yeah. So, that's stupid to say because he closed the season not awesome, right? And I get the injury stuff, and then off season was not really an off season, but like Tyrese Halliburton's like amazing, and if he's that good again, they're gonna be great, pretty much regardless. That's a difference with the Kings is he's better than anyone that they have. And the other difference is for the, what you just said about the surprise factor. Mm-hmm. And he's Eric what's lot when I'm about to say, they say this, they say their offense is random and it is because mm-hmm. it's not like this means do this. This means do that guaranteed patterns. It is for very free flowing. They know what they're doing, but that means every night uh, it's hard for other teams to predict what's happening next, yes. especially when it's moving fast and clicking and they're passing as much as they want. So if it truly can continue to be random, which it is to us and to their opponents, and I guess to them, but like they know what they're doing, then you can still be surprising and hard to guard, right? And we have heard yes. from even Joe Mazzula, who just won the championship, but lots of people about like, yeah, playing the Pacers was hard, right? Like, so <laughs> if that if that is, is if just a maintainable offensive system, forget the defense, forget the player growth, like their floor is still pretty close to 45 to 47 range. So. Yeah, we we can go through the downsides. I think though we've we've made the case that there's way more ways they go over than under. Are they going to be under 500? Like, do they have a shot no, being under no. 500? No. Okay. The so if it's stinks. exactly if it's yeah. under, it's maybe 44, like 45, like even like so it's if they're under 500. Well Tyrese Halliburton played less than 40 games, less than 30 games, maybe. And even that, I mean, they went seven and six without him last year. I mean, I was, yeah. That is worse. If they're under 500, I've got a lot of concerns. <laughs> One more break here, guys. We got to talk about the lovely folks over at Game Time, the best way to get tickets to the sports, music, theater, comedy, whatever you're going to near you because they make it so easy to get the tickets without any guesswork, without any fluff or nonsense. They have curated deals to make it easier to find the best prices on great seats. They have super deals. They have seat views right there that are spot on. I used it in Barclays Center. And it was exactly right. They have their lowest price guarantee. They have event cancellation protection. They have job loss protection. You can toggle off hidden fees. And their new feature, Game Time Picks, 
makes it even easier to see your favorite teams play live because they filter out the fluff to only show you incredible deals on great seats. You don't have to waste time, and you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Lockdown NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code L O C K E D O N NBA for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. I, I think it's possible that they are like the same level of team. That's mm -hmm. possible to me. But them being much worse or like appreciably worse or clearly can't re recapture the magic, that would surprise me. Mm -hmm. um, and I will forget the preseason happened <laughs> the second I say that sentence because <laughs> that was not, not particularly inspiring, even though they were awesome on offense. Uh, okay. Bold predictions. Everyone's favorite podcast topic. And I, I put breakout candidates because that's also a lot of people's favorite season preview kind of thing. But the Bears have like a bunch of those <laughs> theories. Yeah. So um we could go either way with that would you like to do a breakout candidate or a bold prediction first and Oof. you're first i'm not going first oh man um i was gonna <laughs> say i'll do whichever one gets me to go second Fine, um, I'll go first. breakout candidate okay. i did I, last year i said this and i'm sticking to it even though it's wrong to do it twice in a row because i thought i was wrong one of the years last year i said pacers x factor is going to be andrew nemhard he waited till the last two games but he showed why i say that this year i'm putting them as my breakout candidate does that even count? Does does those two games count as breaking out? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Wimby's the leader for most improved, so I don't know what the criteria for anything yeah, is right now. So <laughs> because he was already that good at the end of last year, but I get I get why that would be a deserved honor if he went there. Yeah, Andrew Nemhard is so good, man. And the third year, I get that he might not have the ball a ton because Halliburton and Siakam are awesome, but the third year is when Siakam won most improved of his career. Yep. And the fourth year, he was an all-star for the first time. And the third year is when Tyrese Halliburton became an all-star for the first time, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is t Aaron Neesmith became who he is in his third year. I could go through lots of other Pacers players if I really wanted to do that exercise. But you get the gist of what I'm saying. Third year, like year one, you're a rookie. Year two, you know what you're doing. You're establishing yourself. And year three, if you're good, you kind of run, right? And this is year three for Andrew Nemhard. And so statistically, it might not like – explode because of the like his usage rate doesn't have a ton of upward mobility because of what the Pacers roster is but I think he's gonna be I've thought this for a while I think he's gonna be really good and if he breaks out at all then that's massive for the Pacers and offsets some of their downside stuff of Halliburton getting hurt again or McConnell look not looking as good older well great they have another ball handler right here uh so I am I've always been bullish on him I still am and because it's your three, I'm going to say he's a breakout candidate again, even though I said this last year. So if I say it forever, eventually I'll either be <laughs> fired or correct. So there we go. <laughs> oh, man, that, that's a more common philosophy than I think we <laughs> care to admit. Shout out half the NBA GMs from uh. 2014 to present. Um, my breakout candidate. So I, I have. One, I want to see what Aaron Neesmith can do beyond the things we've expected from Aaron Neesmith. Like we talked after so many of the Knicks games, it was like he's hitting shots off the dribble. Like, whoa, yeah, way, yeah, he's he's dribbling and like did doing you, stuff. Did That's you crazy. Take mental note of the floater he took against the Hornets. I, I did. was like, I sure Ooh. did. <laughs> Ooh. Yes, if different. Aaron. If Aaron Neesmith can be something other than a battering ram at all times on either end of the floor, that would be considered a breakout for me because that yeah. just changes his usefulness on on every facet of the game. But my actual breakout candidate is Isaiah Jackson. Wow. And Whoa. I did not expect I know, you to say that. I know. I, well I, I didn't. Yeah. Well, like I said, I think we saw in the playoffs, like he was the guy, like he guarded Jason Tatum on the perimeter as good as just about anybody else did. And you, I know you and I were fanboying and, and freaking out about that because I think we, you and I have been on the same page with what Isaiah Jackson can do. Um, and yeah. I, I think, you know, James Wiseman isn't good. <laughs> like, so he's not good. So the Pacers, if they need a backup five, will have to rely on Isaiah Jackson because I just don't think. Like, I don't think you can go full time OB or Siakam at the five for an 82 game regular season. I just don't think you could do that. And if Isaiah Jackson can play well, then he's going to play more, which means he's going to get more comfortable, which means he could play well, which means he could play more. And it's just going <laughs> to, I think it's a feedback loop that the Pacers almost need him to get in. And I think that they, 
we don't really have another option unless Jarius comes through and can they can just play ultra big at the three four five with the um, with Jarius Ob and Siakam like that. But I, I Jax, let's see it. Look, I get that he played a good amount of garbage time last year. I don't think people realize how good a sixty eight point nine percent true shooting percentage is. Like yep. that is <laughs> that's phenomenal. That's what Isaiah Jackson had last year. Now I he has this this jumper addition thing going on. There is going to be a limit to how many of those make sense because he's such a good finisher and has such a vertical like this vertical spacing element that he should be adding. But if it's one flip it in from a little farther away or one like hey, I took a 10 footer and made it again per game. That's it's a big deal, right? Uh so I think it's totally possible because, yes, like you, I have always said, switch defender Isaiah Jackson's just such a monster for a five. Yep. And he's not as good defending fives, which is not good because that's the nope. position he's he's playing. It's actually interesting. I I want to see him and Wiseman together. I don't think it will go very <laughs> You're a well. You're sicko. But I want to see it because Wiseman's yeah. definitely his best is defending fives. Yeah, and I Jacks on a forum I'm like, yeah, okay, that's that's fine. They don't, they will have no spacing at all. But I want, I want to to see it. I think we'll probably max out at 25 minutes at this whole season. But, uh, <laughs> 25 might be high, but yeah, that's probably right. But yeah, I think I think it's very much possible that Isaiah Jackson has a breakout season because he already is efficient and has a way he can be very impactful on offense, and he very rarely turns it over. And he cut out the stupid fouls. He still fouls a lot. But not the really, really stupid, what are you doing kind of fouls. And that's why his impact took off last year. And most importantly for the Pacers is he proved he can play in the playoffs. And that's what they need because they're that's what they think about now is that not the regular season. So neither of us pick Ben Mather or Jarris, huh? Or we just hate I him? don't know. Does that I don't the conditions I, exactly. That's what I was gonna say. I don't think there's another player on the roster who will be in the rotation like concrete enough who will have the context to break out other than guys like Nemhard Neesmith or someone like Isaiah Jackson, yeah. because of the scarcity at his position. Like if Matherin breaks out, then I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. And Walker could just break out by breaking into the rotation. So like, if that's considered a breakout, then sure. I, I would probably pick that over Ajax, but I don't know what that looks like. like yeah, that that's true. Uh, both. I mean, very logically, just on the path of being a lottery pick, <laughs> they are right. both also breakout candidates. Right. I mean, Ben Matherin, for a lot of the same reasons I just said about Andrew Nemhart, it's year three, year 2.75, I guess, if you want to count whatever you want to count his injury last year. Yeah. Um, and clearly showed some more in the preseason, to me at least. The defense on ball is a little better. Decision making was just a little faster. The Cleveland game will live in my head for forever. Uh, so. I mean, if that if that translates at all, it's him, right? It's him. And then that changes the way you think about your team and who should be out there with who and all that. And Jarris also evolving in any way into a rotation player is is the answer. And he looks like it could be so far. Um, those feel more obvious. And I just think the floor of what we know of, of Nemhard is why I'm picking him. Uh, mm -hmm. Regression candidates, is there any answer besides the 30-year-old you already discussed? Uh, I think Nemhard, maybe. Oof. You can't do that after I called him a breakout candidate. I, I mean, oh, we just wow. talked about the over versus the under in the cases for it. Like, I don't know if, you know, the over 30 is, again, the, the pretty obvious one. But, you know, if there's a, you know, if, if Nimhard doesn't end up being as, like, I think we were all excited about him because of how well he played with the ball and, like, the amount of, impact he was having on the game but with more mouths to feed assuming that Jairus is in there assuming Matherin is in there now Siakam is there for the entire season and now like I just I can see a world where he's more of like the dirty work facilitate like keep the ball moving defend and doesn't really get to run the offense as much even in a context that is random like the Pacers like to play I don't again I don't really know who else could regress that would be noteworthy unless it is just the the old guys which th there's not really that many of them so well, let me I guess give Tur you Turner losing a step on defense would be massive. Well, my Turner regression would be playing 77 games again. I mean that was remarkable well. from him. Okay, let me give you let me just throw this note in there. All right. Let me see let me see as I'm explaining what I'm saying if you can figure out what point I'm talking about. I want I bet okay. at some point I'll figure it out again. Gotcha. So let's go back in time. 
2019-20 Indiana Pacers, they had a player on their roster named Justin Holiday. And Justin Holiday Mm -hmm. was in a contract year. And that season, Justin Holiday uh, upped his three-point attempt rate over the prior season on a per-game basis uh, and made 40.5% of those. And then the Pacers gave him a very nice three-year deal, commiserate with like a good role player, a forward who can come off the bench and make some threes and fits really well. And then he did not shoot that good ever again. It still hasn't in a full season since then. And I think Justin Holiday is a fine to good shooter in the NBA. He's, he was still in the league until this year since then. Like, he's good. But he had a, a very – that was still, for a long time, the only season that effective from deep of his entire career. Obi Toppin, uh, last year, took a major step as a shooter. Now, here's the thing. He was Obi Toppin's much earlier in his career than Justin Holiday was at that time. And Obi Toppin went through a very obvious form and approach to shooting change in a way that makes me believe that he will be pretty close to that good of a shooter again. But I've seen it before where a guy has a very nice shooting one year and it's not like they stop working on their shot, but just that's how samples can work. And Justin Holiday, the following year was like 38, 37%, but it never felt the same. It felt like he would go seven for seven or two for yep. seven. Right. And so I don't think Obi top is a regression candidate because of his age or ability. In fact, he's, very, he's a specifically good fit with the Pacers compared to other teams. But the shooting element in particular, which is what made him very, very far exceed my expectations last year, I just that that kind of has to sustain. And I wonder about it, even though I do think he'll be pretty close to the same level of shooter. Yeah, I when did you figure I, it out? Did you ever figure it out in my explanation? Oh, yeah. Justin yep. Holiday? I as soon as you started <laughs> talking about Justin Holiday and three point percentage, I was like, because <laughs> and really OB is is one of the more uh, again it's not obvious but like i don't think ob regressing is that big of a deal yeah probably not and so that's why i, I just wasn't that worried about like if Nimhart, be smaller because yeah comes on the team the whole year right and and jaris walker they're gonna it's, have yeah, to try to find some thing. way and so you know matherin's playing that's taking less minutes so like i didn't think it would be he might be the biggest regression candidate as far as like role from last year to role to this year as well as impactfulness within that role so yeah, that the true. combination of that may may end up being true but uh, as far as meaningful impact on the pacers outlook like uh, making the case for the under for instance if miles loses a step offensively or defensively okay that's huge if siakam or mcconnell ends up doing something differently ends up being slow or, or nimhard ends up you know being less confident because he doesn't have the ball in his hands or whatever it is like i think those are meaningfully impactful could swing two or three games each whereas obi toppin he shouldn't be as impactful as any of those guys um, heading into the season, even though I think you're probably right. Now, to be clear, I would be surprised at regression from any of the non over 30 year olds, like, yep. like obvious regression, not just like, Oh, yep. they're a little worse. You know what? That's whatever it's season to season kind of stuff. Yep. Um, but the, the candidate list certainly exists, but they're a young team. Most of their players should be there. I even think Siakam could be better, like with mm-hmm. a training camp and an off season and, uh, with the way NBA training on your body is now, the, the decline age is a little later. A little later, not much. Uh, any bold predictions, or did we just kind of do that with our breakout candidates? <laughs> I, I think we talked about just about every single player. So uh, I don't have very many bold predictions other than I, I think that, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I can see a, like where Jarris ends up closing more games in the back half of the season than either Neesmith or Nimhard. I don't know which one, but I think Jairus could end up in a situation where he is just closing games. My bold prediction, I'll be a little against the grain of fans. I bet they have similar struggles against bad teams Mm. because if their style of top, whatever offense and bottom, whatever defense remains, Mm -hmm. That is just high variance. It's just how it is. Jordan and Poole so, and Kai Kuzma are going to feast. <laughs> yes. So I still think it's possible with the randomness and just like, oh my gosh, they just scored 40 and a quarter that they could yeah. beat anybody again. But I think without, like maybe this this massive increase in their zone usage, which went from like very much never to like once every 20 possessions. <laughs> but that's still right. a huge increase from last year. 
If that bumps their defense from 26 to 22nd, then maybe they'll look stupid for this. But I do think it's possible that they are are similarly – they can win or lose like any night kind of team. Yeah. I mean, that's not a bold prediction because they just did that. But I think a lot of people have thought, oh, more mature team, they'll do better against these bad teams. And I get that. I think that's totally possible. But I think, I think boldly, I mean, that it's totally possible that their style just lends to this for a while until they – either can get their defensive floor up or I, I, honestly, that's probably the whole answer. Yeah. They have got to do that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, the Does really count bold, bold. They just did uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> that's logical. So I'd say probably not. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Pacers are in the play-in game. Like that could be bold just because if that's true, but they were one win from that last year. That's like, not that I don't know. it's like they, were, they could be the three seeds. Like, Oh, they were one win away from that too. So I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it, it's tough with seeding things because of how yeah. close eight through two was last year. Yeah. Yeah. Cause no. everyone's like, Oh, seven seed. That's ridiculous. I'm like, they had a tiebreaker last year. Like <laughs> they had, it's like, that's not that crazy. I, I think they'd be disappointed to be in the play in, but that's not crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Bold would be like, Oh, they're, se- they're clearly second. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's bold. <laughs> that's bold. Yeah. That's bold. It's hard. It's hard. Um, I have nothing else in terms of big overseeing predictions for the season. So I'll put my stamp on it and say 49 and 33 fifth in the East. And that is my huh. end of predictions episode. Gotcha. I'm I'm going 50 and 32, uh, which I think will, will be good enough for the third seed actually. Wow. Because I think that that, I think the middle of the East is going to eat each other up. They are so bad. And I think Boston being without KP is gonna like, I don't think there's going to be a championship hangover in the traditional, like, you know, in the traditional sense where they're just going to struggle, but it's a, it's just a big loss. It, it just is. So um, I, I think that that's just going to end up battering. And if the Pistons are even slightly better and you know, the Nets can play the Hawks and the, Hornets can maybe be a little healthy and play competent basketball. I think it could the East could eat itself up and the Pacers could come out higher than expected, even with only 50 wins. It's also close. I already mentioned it that they win that Giannis game. They win the central yep. division and they're the three seed. Last uh no. Yeah, they three. They'd be three. Yep. Last year. Mm-hmm. Like they win one more time against Cleveland and they're the four seed. Last year. Right? Like it's it, this. These, this this feels like bold or brash to like do this, but that's how close the East was. And yeah. so I get that all these other teams made these splashy moves, but also Sands, the Celtics, the teams that did those things have older players or are already like, how many guys are hurt? And wow, they're all kind of good or important. Uh, so we'll see. We will see, but I'm glad to have an official prediction on there. And now I can look stupid and everybody can make fun of me all season because that, is everyone's favorite thing. So please direct your complaints to at Rhett underscore Bauer. Rhett, where else can people find you and the things you have to say? Oh no, that's that's the only place you'll find me. I will receive your complaints with open arms. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Feel free to uh, to take my Pacers are going to make the play in game or be worse than the Hawks or uh, Hornets out of, uh, completely out of context and uh, yeah, <laughs> run with it. Oh, worse than the Hawks or Hornets would be a catastrophe. That would be quite full. <laughs> Uh, yeah i don't uh, there's not a path worse than the heat how about that uh, that is worse plausible. Than the heat. that's that's that plausible jimmy yeah. but this is the last time of jimmy Butler's career he really has to try <laughs> get paid one more time but then he right. can kind of ride it out you know <laughs> yeah oh. maybe they'll be good maybe they uh. will but maybe they'll be good i like their starting five i'm not sure about the rest of our team we are talking about too many other teams that means it's time to get out of here. Rhett, thank you for the time. Also, I just got a message about this. Jalen Suggs, who signed an extension today for you guys listening to this, goes on Locked on Magic, talking about it right now. So good way cool. to get Jalen Suggs being very rich on this very ne- network. So check that out. Uh, back tomorrow here, talking Pacers Pistons. Woohoo! A real game. Not talking about what could be or exhibitions. Real games, real records, real stuff to break down. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all so much for tuning in and listening all offseason long. We'll see you very soon. <laughs>